blackouts. Hey YouTube, Jason here. So Harbor Freight has come out with a really nice inverter generator that can do 240 volts. And being an inverter generator, you can parallel them together. And these, these generators are incredibly popular. Um, they are always out of stock. And when they do come into stock, they'll sell out within just a couple of days or less. So if you see one at your local Harbor Freight and you want to get it, you need to go ahead and jump on it quick or they will go out of stock. But what Harbor Freight hasn't come out with yet is the parallel kit for these things to allow them to be linked together to double your output power. Um, there are a, a lot of parallel kits on the market, but none of them actually, apart from one that I found, um, are, will handle 240 volts, you know, linking two 240 volt ones together. They're all made for the smaller generators. So what we've got here is I've uh, got this stuff rigged up. We had uh, that snow apocalypse recently in Texas where we had the blackouts and people can't really cool their house with um, natural gas and propane. So in the summer months coming up, there's going to be even more power used and I'm concerned about rolling blackouts. So got these and I needed to be able to power my all electric house. So I needed to combine two of these things together. So um, this was me kind of getting everything hooked up and um, we're actually starting this up for the first time here on video. Kind of checking the connections, making sure the eco throttle's off. Now later on, I actually turned um, on the eco throttle and it works just fine. But uh, for the first test, I wanted to make sure the generators were completely spun up. And I'll go over the parts list, but I got those meters off Amazon and added those to that box. So whichever one you start first is the master, and then the secondary unit that you start will basically slave to the first and match that one's frequency. And it's kind of an automatic process, and they end up working together and really double your, doubling your output power. So at this point, going back over to the breaker box and going to turn, uh, go and turn on the master switch. So there went the power to the house. And when I was first doing this, I was being really conservative. So I turned off my sub panel that breaks out the outlets and lights and stuff for the interior of the house and turned off the water heater and then um, kicked it on. Then at the time I realized the water heater wasn't actually heating since it's on a thermostat, it wasn't you know needing to be turned on. So um, ultimately I ended up just turning everything on and just rolling with it to see what we would end up with. And it handled just handled it just fine. So there's the sub panel. Now the entire house is on the generator power. And go back over and we're gonna take a look at the loads. So my particular breaker box, the way things just kind of randomly worked out is I end up with one leg that runs typically about seven amps higher than the other leg, which isn't ideal, but if you end up balancing it out, it depends on how you think about it. Like if your clothes washer and some other appliances you, you wanna put on, if you can arrange to have those on the lighter leg, um, then it maybe balances and lets you work a little more, you know, casually in the house. So here's where we're turning on the AC unit. You'll see that first surge there, the 9.3 jumped up. There it spiked to 18. Yeah. So that was the AC unit kicking in. And then I went around to check the condenser. Now I did cheat. I have a soft start unit on the AC, which allows the compressor to start without needing, you know, 80 or 100 amps. Soft start. You gotta have that if you're gonna, if you have a large AC unit, you just have to. Okay, so now we're going inside and I wanted to show you how the box actually goes together, what I did to actually make this. So first off, special props to him. I believe he pronounced his name Jason Willoughby. He was the first one on YouTube to come up with the idea of the parallel kit, putting them together. And he identified this power horse kit that actually works and works really well with the generators and properly fits it. Um, I did have to shave down the white, the corners of the white uh, 
neutral, but apart from that, uh, it does fit really well with the with the Harbor Freight one. But they make a lot of generators. Uh, their generators are quite a bit more expensive, but the idea behind theirs is they're intended to just join the generators together. There's, it's a short cable. You just link them together, and you're supposed to use the outlet that's on the generator itself. Um, but the Harbor Freight ones only have a 30 amp plug on them. And for what I need is more than 30 amps. So we have to have an outlet ourselves. We have to make our own outlet between the two generators, which is what I've done here. Uh, the box is designed to be mounted on a pole. That's I've silicon sealed the holes shut on the back of it, but, and added some little conduit hooks onto just to the existing screws to kind of hang it on the generator bar. So this is an RV hookup and you ended up using that. So I took the power horse cable that Jason recommended and ended up chopping it and he cut his in half and it was, it was, he was really unhappy with the length of it, the when he spliced them together. So um, these are just caps that protect the end of it and the tips are isolated or insulated. So you can't shock yourself if you accidentally touch it, which is nice. So I took mine and I cut it on the end, very close to the end. So what you're seeing here is pretty much the full length of the cable. In fact, this is the other end over here. Um, so that where, where you see that bulge is where the where the cut was. So that what you're seeing on the left is almost the entire cable. There's this issue with the with that cable being too short. So I ended up buying my own cable from Lowe's. Uh, get eight gauge, don't get ten. Get the eight gauge uh, stranded wire. You're dealing with some high current stuff here. You want to make sure it's going to be safe. But I wanted to mimic uh, the way the Power Horse had made there. So I got this um, nylon sleeve that goes over the wires. Uh, I'll show you that on the screen here. I'll put the link in the descriptions. But you're going to need that uh, threaded cabling, four colors, you know, four wires, green, white, red, and black. And that's going to match the green, white, red, and black on the end of the of the power horse cable. And what I'd originally done is use these um, butt splices that you can get that uh, have heat shrink and they have a little band of solder in the middle that makes a nice nice uh, butt slice where you can link two wires together. They're great for automotive use and kind of low, lower voltage stuff, even, even you know, normal ones in power. But... The biggest one that I had, and I put these two th together, and they just didn't feel right. I was about to start load testing it, and it really was creeping me out. Um, so I ended up doing a better splice on it. And I'm glad I did because when I took it apart, they just all but fell apart. It would have been a really big deal. It probably would have caught on fire had I actually put it under significant load. So don't mess around with this stuff. This is some high amperage, you know, dangerous stuff here. Um, so we're looking at you know 30 or 40 amps going through this potentially. So anyway, I found this um, butt splice at Lowe's. I'll show you the screen here where it's on their website and they sell it in the stores. It's designed to be uh, underground sealed. So in hindsight being 2020, I would have, um, I actually made a mistake when putting it together. So you can see there's a little piece of heat shrink coming out the end of those wires. Um, I didn't realize that this heat shrink actually has this goo with this glue um, adhesive inside it that seals the wires up. So again, when I was doing the splice, um, I ended up kind of compromising the waterproofness of it on accident because I didn't realize it had that glue goop stuff I was talking about in there. So what it, when you do this, if you want to go this route, um, don't bother with your own heat shrink on this. Just use what it comes with, get it all lined up and, and clean, run the nylon webbing up into there and heat the whole thing. And you're going to get lots of this goo sealant stuff that comes out and would basically just lock everything in place. I didn't realize it was going to do that. And I was afraid the wires were going to slide within that little terminal block that's in there, that little bracket that holds the, the metal plates. And um, so I put heat shrink on it first to hold the wires in place before I put their big shrink on the outside. And in doing so, I basically gave the water a little tunnel in, into it along the wires. So again, now that I know how it works, and I don't want to redo it, but now that I know how it works, it would make more sense to just use the existing stuff and roll with it because it'll, it'll do a good job of sealing everything up for you. Now you do need the heat shrink where it goes into the box here. So those, there's metal clamps designed for Romex. And I added like two layers of heat shrink there because I wanted to have some strain relief for the cables and to not have it bend too much there. So that you know, the, it's pretty, pretty firm, you know, it's not, it's not going to really have to have too much of a bend there. So it does a real good job for strain relief right there. And again, so I got a little bit fancy and got those, those, uh, amp meters on there. I can show you the page on, on the, where they are on Amazon. They were about eight bucks when I bought them. They've raised the price some, but it's still pretty reasonable. Um, use a stepper bit, drill your hole out. Um, I believe it was a three quarter inch hole. And then you can run those through the panel mount with a little, and they just kind of clamp down on the backside and have a little coil that you run around the, the output and it goes into the dryer plug on there. So problem I ran into was there was just such 
limited space in there. And they don't make wire nuts that are big enough to accommodate two eight gauge wires plus the six gauge wire that you need to go to the dryer plug. Again, we're talking, you know, 30, 40 amps from each side, but when you combine them together and go into the dryer plug, now we're looking at 50, 60 amps. So I wanted to play it safe. Yeah, you could probably could get away with eight gauge. It's a really short run inside there, but still wanted to play, you wanted to play it safe. So I use six gauge, um, short length of six gauge wire for the connections, but that stuff is stiff, st super stiff and super hard to work with in that tight enclosure. And I, I barely got the thing closed, truly barely got it closed. So, um, I, yeah, it was, it was just crazy tight fit to the point where I, that metal plate you're seeing there on the front, is it even, it's supposed to sit flush and it's raised up. I had to switch the screw out on there because it's such a tight fit inside there with everything. So if I had to do it over again, hindsight being 2020, I would suggest anyone watching this, and unless you just really want this compact box, go with a larger box, one that's designed as an RV hookup that has breakers incorporated into it because that's going to give you a bus bar and you can clamp your wires to the bus bar really cleanly. You can clamp your other wires directly to the uh, breakers. It makes all the hookup really easy. You don't have to deal with these obnoxious, um, expensive 20 bucks a piece, um, terminal blocks that I had to deal with when I was putting this thing together. Cause they, again, they don't make wire nuts big enough. So I had the only way I could join the wires together with these insulated terminal blocks that are about 20 bucks a piece. And I needed three of the three terminal ones and a four terminal one for the ground because there's an extra ground wire that grounds the box itself to everything. So, um, between those terminal blocks, the stiff wires, um, and the and the especially stiff six gauge wire needed to hook up to the actual dryer plug itself. Um, it was it was tight fit. That's why I'm not that's not why I'm not showing you the inside of the box. Is I'm literally afraid I won't get it back together again. So um, it's very tight fit. Now if, maybe if you spend a little more time on it, give yourself a little more uh, room on the pigtails than I did on mine. Uh, you might have a little better luck with it. But um, you know, your mileage may vary and just be aware it's going to be a real tight fit to get all this stuff in that box, especially with the amp meters on there. Now, as far as the uh, little, little label things on there, those are just labels like you put on your mailbox. I just wanted to label the X leg and the Y leg so I could keep an eye on the voltage one, well, not so much the voltage because it's going to be standard across the two things, but I wanted to know the amperage coming out of that dryer plug. And so when you have two units hooked up, you have to just assume that you're getting 50% from each unit because they're going to team together. If you've got one unit hooked up, then you're seeing the full amperage, you know, coming off of it. So if you see 30 amps, you can realize that you're getting 15 from each generator if you're looking at the amp meter on there. So that's, uh, that's the general idea here. Let me know if you guys have any questions and um, put them in the comments. I'll be happy to try to answer them.